32. You know I can't go past my fingers and toes. That's just not fair. All right. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi. Yeah. One day, but not today. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans. It's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. The podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, we're going to let our guests introduce themselves. We will start from left to right in no special order. Uh, Larry Korea, can you introduce yourself to anyone that lives under a rock and doesn't know who you are? Uh, yeah, I, I'm Larry Korea. I'm a novelist. I, I write books with uh, Bay and Books primarily. I, I'm best known for the Monster Hunter International series, but I've done a bunch of other stuff like Hard Magic and uh, Saga of the Forgotten Warrior and Tom Stranger and a bunch of other things. So, uh, yeah, no, that, that's me. Stones, uh, Tom Stranger is my happy music at work. Oh, yeah. I love Tom. <laughs> and uh, Steve Diamond, um, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers as well? Yeah. Um, because no one knows who I am anyway, right? You know, it's not like Larry. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, my name's Steve Diamond, uh, primarily a horror author, actually, um, from uh, do a lot of stuff with Bane now and uh, Wordfire Press. Um, I've written for a lot of role-playing games. Um, yeah, big, big-time big horror guy. Outstanding. Well, the next part of the introduction, dear listener, is how we first found them. So I found Larry. I met him in person at the last HonorCon, which was, what, 2018, I think? Uh, he was yeah. really nice. So I checked out his books. We were involved with a, the great debate with uh, Marco Clues about the proper order to assemble a hamburger, I remember. I'm not sure your position on it, but it was just entertaining. Because, you know, what else are you going to argue about while people are drinking beer? Uh, and then I stumbled on his podcast, The Writer's Jojo, where I found Steve, and he amused me. So I searched out books he had written to get him on the show, because he's funny. And uh, I didn't realize when we invited you for this particular book that you wrote that with Larry. So we're going to have you back again about just your stuff, because why not? That's right. All right. Good to now, be. Larry, you, have inter you were here on episode one at the beginning, so you were the founding father of the religion questions. But Steve, yeah. now you get to your trial by fire. So Doc, here we go. see if he gets to stay. He All gets right. to stay. Would you quit sounding like you might be actually in charge of something? One day. So, <laughs> Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Which one would you pick? Ooh, we're going to say Old Testament Star Wars. Oh, nice. The Old Testament of Star Wars is the best. That's right. They made excellent movies. There were three of them. I just wish they'd make more. I know. If only if only there had been more Star Wars after that, I think the world would have been a better place. There was the Rogue oh. One fan film was pretty good. Yeah, that was, that was I have heard that was pretty phenomenal. If you like the Rogue One fan film, you should listen to the Angry Staff Officer. It's a podcast. They broke down everything wrong with the strategy and the logistics of that operation and why it was destined to fail from the beginning. Oh, it's so bad. Uh, it I have bad. heard that the, uh, star, the bastard child of Star Wars and Firefly is pretty good, though. Mandalorian. Fair. I like. I, I enjoy it. I've yeah, it's, it's pretty good, especially if you're fans of, like, you know, some of the old, like, samurai Western films. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Josh, you got one more. Okay. Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or the Wheel of Time? Oh, you know what? We're we're just gonna we're gonna stick with the classics. We're gonna stick with Lord of the Rings, because um, because uh, <laughs> I grew up reading The Hobbit and uh, and and the the original trilogy. So, The Hobbit is how short people learn they too could be heroes. That's right. <laughs> That's right. There's Don't room. tell my mom that. There's room for <laughs> Your mom time. likes me. It's okay. I don't need her getting any more bold than she is. I look like one of the dwarves. I'm like looking at my picture right now. This is I, true. I haven't shaved for a while. So. <laughs> I'm a six foot five dwarf. So, you know, I tried to grow a beard and I look like the Unabomber. So I just go clean shaven. You know what? You blend in in my family. You should have seen Larry in his murder hobo days. Oh, I went for <laughs> yeah, big, yeah. bushy beard. So. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, I look like Gimli. <laughs> that's, that's not a bad look. I, I approve. <laughs> Okay, so, and both of you guys can answer this, but which was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy? Ooh, for me, it's fantasy for sure. Fantasy. I like them both, but I, I first love was fantasy. Yeah, same for me. So what was your first memory of engaging in fantasy then? Was it um, reading The Hobbit, watching the cartoon, which was epic? The, I think it was out in the 70s. Nice. Uh, Looking was, in the mirror and realizing you're secretly a giant, Larry. <laughs> no, my first my first fantasy was actually um, Elf Stones of Shannara. Oh, good one! Mom, I loved that one. My yeah. mom picked up out of a um, 
somebody's yard sale. Yeah, it had it was missing its cover. <laughs> it's a 1970s so, something edition. Yeah, or 80s. Yeah. yeah. So you know, oddly enough, mine is very similar. It was it was the Shinar series, but I didn't get to read them. Um, it I they were up on my on my mom's shelf. She had the original three, you know, Ooh. Uh, Sword, Elf Stones, and Wish Song. And I remember seeing them, and they were so huge at the time. Um, and then Brandon came into existence and made them all look tiny. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I saw them up there and I thought, I asked my mom, I'm like, I want to read those. Those are awesome. She said, nah, not today, kid. And she gave me, um, she gave me Lloyd Alexander, the book of three. And so oh, that was okay. actually my very first one. Um, and then Narnia and then The Hobbit. And then I decided I was, I decided I had to read all the big books. So that's when I did Lord of the Rings and, uh, and uh, Shannara. Yeah. Ooh. That works. I did spend a summer looking through the uh, the creek near my house, wandering around looking for the elf stones as I wandered through the through the water. Joke. That'd have been awesome. I didn't find them, unfortunately. You sure, your mom just didn't lock you out of the house. Maybe there was some of that. I was like one of the last of the latchkey kids, so it was all good. <laughs> all right. So now the uh, important question. What is it you love about speculative fiction as a genre that encompasses encompasses all of the things? So I'm not limiting you to just fantasy or sci-fi. <clears throat> Boy, for for me, I'll take a horror take on it, and that's the um, I like how one there, there's the escapism aspect of it. You can you can read things, you you can experience things that you definitely wouldn't want to experience in real life, and it's a safe environment for it. Um, plus, I mean monsters who doesn't like freaking monsters i love monsters i love seeing monsters eat people and murder things i mean what's not to love about that <laughs> i will admit there's something very therapeutic after a rough day at work absolutely this is why i actually write like short fiction i wrote a story once about an auditor who'd had a bad day because i'd just gotten home from work having had a bad day That's fair. <laughs> i was an account what? accountant Fair. So what about you, Larry? What is it about speculative fiction, uh, the umbrella genre that you love? It's like the coolest job ever because I get to just make up lies and, and bull crap and get paid a lot of money for it. And it's super fun. <laughs> no, I, I love, I love, I'm just, I'm a compulsive storyteller. Always have been ever since I was a little kid. Uh, and so it's just, I, I love it. I just, it's a hoot. And so I just kind of enjoy the entire process and uh, I, I like entertaining people. All right. And so many authors will let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So are there any specific formidable moments that you think shaped you as a storyteller? Larry, this time you get to answer first. Ooh, geez. I don't know. I, uh, that's a tough one. I, uh, I don't have anything specific, like, uh, but I do definitely draw heavily from real life. Uh, I steal liberally from people I know. Uh, good lines. <laughs> Uh, funny events, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff like that happens in different books is just thinly veiled versions of real life stuff, like made cooler and funnier. So, don't have any specific examples. You know that that scene of Monster Hunter where uh, they they they're visiting this redneck trailer park, and uh, there's an outside couch, and there's dog sleeping on the couch. And they tell the cat they tell the dog to get up. And they smack the dog. Dog pees all over the couch cushion. So the redneck's like, oh, I'm sorry. And he just flips the couch cushion over so they can sit on the dry side. <laughs> That's a true story. I actually had that happen to me. So there you go. <laughs> All right. So, Steve, can you top that one? <laughs> no. No, I can't. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big sucker for, um, for cop fiction, um, whether, whether, you know, straight up noir stuff or like supernatural noir stuff. And that's because I grew up in a cop family. I mean, my dad, my dad was a career cop. And so I, I lived and breathed that for, you know, as long as I that's, can remember. That's yeah. gotta be hard. Like I was a soldier yeah. spouse after I got out of the army and somebody looked at me and went, that's gotta be so hard. And it, they were, it was a cop's wife. And I went, no, I'd rather have him go on deployment and only worry about him for a set number of months. Yeah, there, there was, there was one time and, and I, and I talk about this when I talk about horror quite a bit, um, you know, cause people say, why do you write horror? And I'm like, cause it's fun and they don't get it. And I'm like, well, you know, real life is is way rough compared to fiction. Um, and, I, and I talk about the time when uh, when my dad, my dad was uh, he worked night shift 
um, at the at the main jail in Sacramento for a while. And uh, there's one night when you're when you're a family of a cop, there's there's certain things you don't want to know. You don't want you don't want late night phone calls and you don't want late night door knocks. Right. Yeah. Right. And so um, we got a late night phone call. And my and I hear my mom run down the hall, get out, you know, answer the phone. And then she's she's out the door and she drives off and it happens within like three minutes. And so, you know, the first thing I thought was, well, crap, did, did I just lose my dad? Like, this sucks. Um, turns out he just he just gotten hurt in a scuffle at the jail, you know, had, had effed his knee a little bit. But, you know, when when you start thinking about those things and you think about the stakes of that, um, I, I pull a lot of that into my writing. And, and I think that that's, you know, telling those sorts of stories so that, you know, it, it's better to read them than to live them. And yeah. so, you know, so that, that I mean, I, I, I pull a lot of that into my writing, I think. And one of the things I noticed since we started writing is you always think <clears throat> the more outrageous stuff, oh, that, that would never happen. And then you hear people's stories and you're like, some of the <laughs> stuff that real happens in real life, if I ever put that in a book, nobody would believe it. Oh my gosh. So, yeah, tell us yeah, about the, um, the, the wreck. The buddy, yeah. So, so one time I got in this, in real life, I got into a bike wreck and uh, I got tore up. I uh, ruined my bursa sac, my rotator cuff. I tore the skin off from basically here to here. I mean, I had chunks of gravel embedded in me and I was in the middle of nowhere though. So I had to walk a couple miles and uh, I did. So I just kind of walked it off. And so then Monster Hunter, I had the character fall off a car and get hurt like that and walk off road rash. And I got somebody all butt hurt in the comment and the in the review is like, no one can walk off road rash. And I was like, of all the unrealistic supernatural monster stuff I put in this book, the one thing the guy cried about was the thing that I had done <laughs> in real life because I had no choice. <laughs> it always amuses me where people's lines in the sand are about where their suspension of disbelief ends. Like, so you were with me at Dragons, but not road rash. Got it. Yeah, it's like, a, well, my choices were, yeah, I could either walk like a mile and a half or I could lay there on the side of the road. <laughs> I mean, that was okay. a decision. I, I don't see you laying there on the side of the road for very long. No, the really stupid part was I was all tore up and we got there and I, and I, and I, I got to my friend's house and took pictures. Uh, we took pictures. We called, we called, the, called for medical and then uh, took photos. And, but I got, I got in like these cool like fighting stances. <laughs> nice. Tore up and covered in blood. Because that's Cause why you know, not, right? When you're like 21. <laughs> so you mentioned fans, but what is the funniest fan interaction you've had? And Larry, you can't use the, one of the one that came to mind for you for me. Oh, geez. But when, when I first met you at Liberty Con, I don't know if you remember it. It's been a few years. I yeah. literally, I was so overwhelmed because I'd read... I hadn't read any of your books yet, but I had read your blog posts. I literally sat there and poked my th hand like I was pressing a reset button. <laughs> and you asked me about it later. And I'm like, huh, let me explain. That was a stupid moment. You know, the only thing that comes to mind. And I was sober and I did that. <laughs> Let's see. You know, Larry and I end up standing next to each other at conventions quite a bit, selling books. And there was, and, and it's obvious the people who, who have actually That's seen, medical Larry, order. you know, they, they've seen Larry, they know who he is usually, but every now and then you have the people come up and cause you know, Larry will be on a panel or something. And, and so I'm standing there selling books and, and I, and I've read all of Larry's books. I've, you know, I've been his pre-reader for a long time. And, and so I sell his books just fine. And so someone would come up and, you know, they'd hear me talking about one of the books and, and they'll, they'll come and say, Oh, hi, uh, it, it's really great to meet you. And I'm like, oh, that's great. And they say, yeah, man, I'm a big fan of your books. And I'm thinking, this is wonderful. No one no one knows who I am and they love my book. This is amazing. And so we talk and talk and talk and it's not for like five minutes. And then so, suddenly I realize, oh, they think I'm Larry. <laughs> and I say, and then, you know, you have to, there's like the awkward transition of, oh, you're not Larry. I'm like, no, I'm not. But here's my book. Do you want to buy it? Like, I mean, we've at that I, point they need to buy it. Now. It's got a Larry cover quote. <laughs> it's true. It does. I mean, at that point, I would buy it if I ever did that. They should just buy it out of out of like out shame of and embarrassment. <laughs> still, the that's money probably why I would do same it. color. It's all good. No, no, I've had some. I've had some weird fan reactions. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've had. I've had a lot. It's hard to think of something particular. 
The weirdest well, thing obviously for me was when I went to the Czech Republic on book tour, went to Prague, and it's, I'm like, I'm like David Hasselhoff in Germany. So I'm like, I'm okay in America, but in the Czech Republic, I'm like a rock superstar. And so I had all sorts of weird stuff. Like people were coming up to me in the bathroom to, for me to sign stuff while I was in the bathroom. Uh, That's a little awkward. They had to come up with like a eight by 10 glossy photo of me to sign. There's jokes there somewhere. Girls would come up and ask me to sign their cleavage my while my wife was there. And so every time <laughs> I would like have the Sharpie and I'd look at my wife and she'd be like, like, okay. It's like, she's like, they're fans. You may. And I'm like, <laughs> I remember Bridget telling me about this. Does she ever have a conversation with you about that afterwards? She's like, if you weren't, uh, if you weren't making so much money right now. Well, if my wife was there, if my wife was not there, there's no flipping way I would ever do that. But she was there. So I was like, are you sure? She's like, they are fans. You may. I'm like, yes, dear. <laughs> you know? she, she is amazing. Uh, um, she is. <laughs> Uh, she is, don't take me wrong, this wrong. I think you're great and I love talking with you, but Bridget is really a lot of fun. Yeah, you've met my wife several times now, you know. Everyone she's feels awesome. She's fine. Yeah, she's awesome. She's still uh, awesome. Yeah, I know, she's awesome. We, I hung out with her a bunch at a 4th of July party and you weren't even there and it was even worse. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but have you had anybody dress up at or cosplay one of your characters or some full, yeah. cool fan art? Yeah, I have um, cosplay. I've seen a lot of cosplay, a lot of a lot of trailer park elves, a lot of different takes on Monster Hunter armor. Uh, you, you do some great descriptions. I've had no, which really does help a cosplayer out, man. I've had cosplayers like cosplay from some of the from of the Facebook gags, like Cookie Monster. Uh, <laughs> I remember. Cookie we had, we had tactical Cookie Monster at Dragon Con one year. <laughs> um, I fan art, that one. crazy amounts of fan art, tons and tons of fan art, paintings, art, um, gosh, I, tattoos. Well, like, also, I know I have a picture of one of the tattoos. My favorite, though, was when Larry cosplayed as a Krasnovian, those evil scum. A tropian <laughs> lives matter. I'm just saying that was hilarious. We can't and for those even, who, a tropian, you know, we can't even keep Krasnovia, we can't even keep up on all the countries we've had genocide with. Yeah. And for those who don't know, it's a fictional company, a country the U.S. government invented just to play out war games for our soldiers. And then when he it's did that, as a gag, Facebook, by author, fantasy authors, apparently. Yeah. And uh, they kicked him off of Facebook for a while because he said it was hate speech because he was making fun of a fake country. That's I what I was going to say. I appointed so myself funny. ambassador of Krasnovia and started talking trash about all the other training center countries that we had beat up. And I was like, you know, we are Krasnovia. We are a great and proud nation, primarily known for our sandwiches. And genocide, but mostly sandwiches. And, and I actually got, and I, one time I referred to um, Pineland. I was attacking Pineland, and I referred to it as Doc Wolrab, but I referred to Pineland as uh, filthy Pinelandian goat rapists. And I got kicked off of Facebook for a month for, for hate speech against an imaginary country. Uh, I remember that Dragon Con. There are many ribbons about uh, I stand yeah. with Krasnovia. No, so I started doing video updates from the Gulag, <clears throat> where I was like wearing a big Russian furry hat and a great coat, and I was and I was speaking with my terrible Russian fake Russian accent, and I was in my basement, my unfinished part of my basement, and I was just like giving these updates from the Gulag. And then when I got freed, when I was able to go back on Facebook, my wife took photos. So my son dressed up in a ga Russian gas mask and an AK-47, and was wearing an Adidas tracksuit. And oh, then, so he's awesome. like escorting me out of prison as I'm like, I can't see. <laughs> I remember that picture. My <laughs> wife climbed up on a tall ladder. So it looked like the picture was coming from a helicopter. That was awesome. <laughs> I'll try to hold back the helicopter jokes. Oh, so, man. So bad. All right. So what about you, what? Steve? Anybody Steve? has cosplayed your horror characters yet? No. I mean... I mean, I guess if someone wants to come as a corpse, they can. But, uh, <laughs> so know. every zombie is really from your books. They just don't know that's, it yet. Yeah, that's totally legit. Yeah. yeah. We need so, someone to take off because there's some pretty baller dude, cosplays. That'd be awesome. There. If we got an object or someone oh an object. Gosh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, but they need to, they'd, they'd have to do like one of the big Iron Man suits like they do for Dragon Con, you know, where they're like 12 feet tall. Yeah. And all oh, yeah. Years. That'd be awesome. The Warhammer like, Marine suits are like that. World War One kind of pseudo steampunk magic <laughs> robot suit. Oh, my that's oh, that so cool. I want to do that, but that would cost like 10 grand. I so you're already <laughs> tall enough for that, so you don't really need to. 
Can you imagine me on those stilts, though, if I wore those, like, the electric but, stilt feet? You really know, nice. you mentioned Dragon Con, and there's an amazing cosplay competition that is specifically for people who are doing cosplays from books. Hmm. Now. Oh, you got a book category now? Oh, oh no, it's its own competition called Page to Stage. Cool. Oh. That's cool. Yeah, I might know the people who run it. Oh, yeah, you know a couple people at Dragon Con, I imagine. <laughs> I run it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Zach, let's get this show moving anyway, so we can talk about the books. Let's right, yeah. talk about I well, I do want to ask them, unless you want me to cut it. Their no, first no, keep time going. when somebody asked them to sign a book. What was that like? So for me, it was in when was that? When did we crash that world fantasy? Was that 2011? <laughs> 20 or 2010. Is it 2010 or 2011? I was new. So 2010 or 2011, Larry and I crashed a world fantasy convention. San Diego. We, to so we totally weren't invited. We weren't invited. No, we just went anyway and just went everywhere anyway. Um, and uh, and I had like I had two short stories. It was my first two sales. Um, and one one was the second one was with Larry. And uh, and we were just kind of wandering around the, the the dealer's hall and you know, people were signing. Neil Gaiman was there, he had a line of like eight million people. Of course. And then, and then you know, everyone else. And uh, the guy who had put together the anthology that I was in. He, he grabbed me and yanked me over and he's like, hey, I didn't know you were here. Uh, here, sit down. I have I have some copies of the anthology for you to sign. I'm like, heck yeah. So I sat down and started signing. I have that picture somewhere. I should find it. Um, it was awesome. I mean, that's, there, there, it was an anthology, right? Like, and, and I was a nobody in it, but um, there, there's something about that experience that's super surreal. I, I remember that like it's yesterday. Yeah, so, my first time was in a gun store, actually. Nice. That's an epic place for it. I bet everyone was very polite. That's very on brand of you, Larry. Well, no, it'd be, it's true because I actually owned a gun store when I wrote my first book. It was self-published. And so I actually the very first copy I ever autographed was to uh, <laughs> to one of my customers at my gun store. So how did you not go get poor buying your own supply? Like that that'd be hard. Uh actually the way the way it worked is when you own the place, you're the last one to get paid. And there was a lot of month of monies there months where there's no money to get paid. So I just be like, ah, I don't have a paycheck. I'll take this one home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. So, so I have a lot of guns from like uh, the early 2000s. <laughs> Fair. So we, we like to encourage people to join newsletters because you don't want to be tied to any one platform because things can go belly up at any time. So, Steve, if people um, sign up for your newsletter, which we'll link to in the show notes, could and you find that picture, could you show them the one you just mentioned? Oh, yeah. I this can... is going out this month, so it'll be going out. Um, next week. So you have, you know, for April, if you find it, you could, you could. Oh yeah. Share I with them. Picture. I can find that. I'm, I, I bet I have it on my Facebook somewhere. Outstanding. All right, doc. You get <laughs> one last question. That was a before crazy. we talk nerdy with books. Yeah, that was nuts. I was I the, the Paul Wilson. Oh, that's right. I did. I geeked out. I'm yeah. Paul Wilson, yeah. Cause he's awesome. He's awesome. So it's a, Jer, I a answered all of them unless you want me to start stealing yours, but you might whine about that again. <laughs> oh, all right. So this is the part of the introduction or introduction interview where we get to ask you, Larry, and then you, Steve, about what you're known for. So the Reader's Digest version, Larry, because you write a crap ton of books. Right? Like the rest of us. <laughs> Tell us just, how you feel about that. I mean, one day when we grow up, we will be Larry Korea. But for now, you know. I don't want to be Larry. I'd rather be Bridget for the record. Yeah, I couldn't be her on account of my garden to never live. Like I just, I got a black thumb. Everything dies in my garden. Bridget's definitely prettier. Um, oh, I <laughs> I, um, okay, by way of introduction, like uh, biggest thing I do is Monster Hunter. That's what I'm known for, Monster Hunter International. Some of the Black Swords, my epic fantasy series. That's my number two one. Uh, Hard Magic is a really popular one, 1930s alternate history. Uh, Tom Stranger is my comedy sci-fi. Gunrunner is my sci-fi with John Brown. Uh, uh, Dead Six is my thriller series with Mike Cooper. And then with uh, Steve, we just did Servants of War, which is, yeah. So. Yeah, dark military fantasy. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, pretty busy. Uh, yeah. Written a couple. Sometimes he sleeps. I don't know. Often. When it's he's like not, it you might know, be your job or something. When he's not invading Pineland. But uh, what about you, Steve? <laughs> what are you what is your body of work? Oh gosh, you know, it's it's a it's a much trimmer, smaller body. Um <clears throat> anemic even. Um so it's uh <laughs> So no, I um, my first novel was called Residue, and it was a, a young adult thriller, supernatural thriller or horror, whichever one doesn't offend you. 
Um, so that's that. I've, I've written a lot of short stories. Um, and then, uh, you know, I put together collections. And, and then, of course, now, you know, Servants of War. And then you had a collection come out this week or last week. Yeah, I had a, I had a story collection of a lot of my own stuff that just came out. I mean, almost all of it's horror. And it's called What Hellhounds Dream. So, cool. Do they dream of electric sheep? No, no. It turned it, all just all awful things. All awful okay. things. Well, they so dream cheap. of nuts on pizza. Doc, oh, that's oh. just wrong. How could you go there? That's, that's, that's not how I eat my pizza, but it's how you do. Doc, you're gonna. I'm gonna have to fire you again. I'm gonna dock your pay. That's it. You're. You, you get half pay. I'll, I'll try whatever, but that sounds weird. <laughs> all right. So while that all sounds fascinating, obviously we're here for the novel you co-wrote since you're both on the stage today. So what was the uh, that be servants of war? So what was the premise for this universe? Where did you come up with the idea? Boy, you know the yeah. It, it, we, we were supposed to write a novel for another place, um, for a game company, and it all completely fell apart. Um, and so we we scrubbed the serial numbers off of it, um, got rid of all the stuff that we didn't want to do anyway, and then just kind of came up with basically kind of theory crafted around the world what we wanted to do. And so um, that's how it came. You know, kind of our, our quick elevator pitch of it is 1917 meets The Witcher. Right. So it's, uh, you know, a standard farm kid who uh, has horrible, terrible, awful things happen to him and then enlists in the military because his country's in a. That's not going to be any better. Yeah. Because his country's in the middle of a war that's been going on for a century. And so. Well, he doesn't really get a lot of choice in the matter no. because like uh, ancient forest spirit tells him to. <laughs> yeah. So so the forest press ganged him. Okay. Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Actually, when the Baba Yaga says, you know, go enlist, you enlist. <laughs> There's probably some poor army recruiter out there going, I wonder if I can get that to stick. <laughs> no, mine just told me girls love a dude in uniform. Yeah, you got to wonder about the one recruiter where you go in and he's got bones hanging from the ceiling and he's got ravens shitting on his shoulder. Yeah, that's that's basically who he signed up with. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about that, though, because we – my, my... – I got a re fate got revenge for me on my drill sergeant for all the lies, my um, recruiter for all the lies he told me. Someone after while I was at boot camp, he got arrested for sleeping with one of the wives and daughters. They were of age, don't worry, of one of the people he put into the army. So he, <laughs> the army got even with him. So I'm like, ah, karmic justice. Same family? Yeah. The guy was going back <laughs> in after a breach of service. So his daughter was 18 and his wife was, I guess, 38 or so. <laughs> and they, they, he got caught because the wife and daughter found out and they got jealous. And so. It became a thing. But yeah, I mean, like, fate got even for me. So, but I don't know if that's going to work with the Baba Yaga. She's like, I don't know that, that she's going to care about that kind of thing. No, it was an episode of The Unit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was it really? I've never watched it. I don't know. I haven't either. <laughs> All right. So, we, we, Doc, stop. Don't die. Before we, uh, before we dive in to talk about the cover, because we're at that time, we were going to take a moment while we pause and shamelessly shill for the man. The war between al Masia and the Empire of Kolokolvia is in its hundredth year. Casualties grow on both sides as the conflict leaves no corner of the world untouched. Alarian Glaskov's quiet life on the fringes of the Empire is thrown into chaos when an impossible tragedy strikes his village. When he is conscripted into the Tsarist military, he is sent to serve in The Wall, an elite regiment that pilots suits of armors made from the husks of dead golems. But the Great War is not the only, or even the worst, danger facing Alarian as he is caught in a millennia-old conflict between two goddesses. He must survive the ravages of trench warfare, horrific monsters from another world, and the treacherous internal politics of the country he serves. Servants of War, New Military Fantasy, by Master of Horror Steve Diamond and international bestseller Larry Correa. Available on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. Pick up your copy today. My recruiter lied to me. All right. Thank you for sticking with us. And Doc's telling us about how her recruiter lied to me, but she can't get through this three-minute commercial break because she's just dying over here. So instead, we're going to come back and we're going to put this glorious cover on the screen. And uh, let me get that See, stuff out My of recruiter there. told me as a medic, I wasn't likely as likely to end up in a hospital. But then he told my mom the other thing, so... Well, see, the they like to tell the National Guard that they'll only deploy us after the Women's Auxiliary, but before the Boy Scouts. So, like, world peace was going to happen in 98. CNN did a special. So I was safe. 
but you know, whatever. You know, yeah, peace in our time, right? Got right, it. Right. But instead of talking about all the lies we get told, we should do an episode about the lies our recruiter told us. That could be like a fireside chat. But for today, we're going to talk about servants of war. So uh, can you tell us where you guys got this idea for this cover? I will say it's glorious, and I want to put a poster on my wall. Uh, actually, uh, Alan Pollock is the artist. Um, and so when we were describing kind of like what the aesthetic was, um, we, we referred him to the, the Polish artist. Um, uh, I can't say i can't remember his name oh gosh what's that guy's name pretty famous artist and we were just like we that's kind of the aesthetic here we were really enjoying and uh alan looked at it and he goes okay cool and then he read the book and he's like oh man i want to draw an object and uh so that's what the big robot suit is yeah the guy's name right. was uh, jacob rosalski i probably pronounced that wrong you know the, the guy that did all of the um he took like all of the polish and russian um like landscapes and inserted okay. like into them oh i've seen that work that's yeah, yeah. awesome stuff yeah yeah. So we we wanted we we really wanted um, something of, of that mindset, um, and we were describing it. And then he came back with this, and we were like, "Hey, that's good." We actually made one change to the book too because of this little behind the scenes. You notice, the object only has three fingers, right. and uh, we never like mentioned like like how many fingers the actual robot suit had, and so we totally changed it. And uh, it actually makes sense because on the gun side, you would disconnect your, your your trigger finger was outside the controls, and that is actually what operated the gun. Hence why okay. it had three fingers. So actually, Alan Alan made us put a cool gun detail into the book. Yeah, <laughs> that is awesome. So did you lean in then to the sort of Russian Polish folklore, or was that just coincidence for an art side? Big time. It was. This is very Slav uh, Slavic folklore inspired, heavily borrowed from stuff oh yeah yeah we yeah super heavy yeah basically if it's from some dark forest anywhere east of estonia we we were stealing stuff from it <laughs> oh yeah yeah i mean i we, love how honest you are about that oh no yeah i'm not one of some of some, some of these uh writers are gonna be like oh i'm so brilliant blah 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 i'm like oh man here's hey steve here's this crazy legend about like you know hey blood some monster. people like kool-aid a lot it's like here's this crazy Latvian, you know, witch story, and you're like, oh, that's awesome. No, so yeah, we're all in on the Slavic folklore. Our timing was great, though, as, as we were saying when this book came out, because um, we wrote a book that was kind of like pseudo Slavic, a lot of Russian names in it and stuff, a big war story, and it came out the week World War Three started. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, our timing was friggin' impeccable for for marketing purposes. Yeah. To, to be fair, though, our guys are fighting for like evil pseudo Russia. It's not like they're fighting for they're fighting for the good guys here. Half the book is them being abused by their own crappy government. So, oh well, <laughs> our timing is great. Yeah, I couldn't have planned it. <laughs> good grief. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that. So, what is your thirty second elevator pitch for this book? Yeah, you know, I I think we just say, um, let's see how I phrase it. I'd say, yeah, this is this is The Witcher meets 1917, where the main character is thrust into a war where gods where gods are the biggest problem, but then the second biggest problem is just enduring a war. So yes. something along so, those lines. Dark, so is it more fantasy or sci-fi? Oh, it's fantasy. It's fantasy. Yeah. So it's okay. dark, dark fairy tale magic world, World War One in the trenches. Yeah. Uh, with guys fighting, you know, crew served giant suits made out of dead golems. Now, when you mention World War One in trenches, does that mean like gas warfare as well? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, gas warfare is a huge part of this book. That's a huge part. Of All this you book. have to do is let Jr. eat Brussels sprouts. You'll have plenty of gas. <laughs> oh man, no, there we have a scene where they're testing this stuff, the Almatian Death Smoke, and uh, they test it on a field of sheep. <laughs> it's so horrific. Yeah. <laughs> so those, it's one of those scenes where you see that Steve's a horror author. Yeah. I had to actually when I went through and edited it, it was like, oh dude, this is too messed up. I gotta like take this down a little bit. Yeah, there are a few. <laughs> <laughs> so can you can we like pay extra for the copy where the horror was amped up more? Oh my gosh. Well, we we still have the original draft. We could sell that for charity. <laughs> yes, yeah, serious. There was a lot. There was a lot. Yeah, there was a, that we pulled back on. There was a few places where it was just like it was just a little too dark. I didn't want to like like I didn't want to scare some readers away because my stuff is usually kind of like you know rated R for violence and but it's it's 
still kind of hopeful and it's more action adventure. Man, Steve had some dark stuff in here, like dark, dark psychological horror stuff. And a lot, it's all, it's all still there. I don't think we took yeah, anything no, out. We just toned it down. There was just a few descriptions where I was like, let's have like, or as, we did, as we've now used the term that we've used to describe this kind of thing is less rats eating people. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's step up in the right direction, I guess. Well, that was like a knob is like how is, is, we decided that was like the description was like, like, like level of rats eating people on any given scene is like some scenes were like 11 and we had to turn them back down to like a seven. You know. All right, but are there scenes where people are eating the rats? Um, no, I did that in Total no. Stranger. We, <laughs> I'm aware. You, we'll, you did. We'll put that one in book. Uh, I promise, I'll put that one in book too. Oh, we will. You, we will. you could always do the uh, demolition man take on that. But, think and, and hey, Jr., maybe they'll even name the person eating the rat Jr. I mean, you know. He I'm, has I'm a okay straight, and then they can die of food poisoning. I'm he okay has a goal that. to be the – he wants to be the new um, The Buckley. Joe Buckley of my generation. JR, send us a Slavic version of your name. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Holy murder the ever-living crap out of you, dude. Outstanding. <laughs> I'm, I'm always game. How so many I, I've been, I've been having, having conversations with friends to find out if we a character is cloned, if that counts as multiple deaths. Oh, for sure. But but oh. I digress. So Doc, I ask him what makes this series special before, before I get us. Wait, what? What, Larry? I killed Joe Buckley three times in one book. You Outstanding. Did. did all three count towards his record? It does because he died as a human being, came back as a werewolf, died, came back as a zombie werewolf, and died. Zombie and werewolf. Last I I I was no before. <laughs> what book was this? I must check this out. Yeah, that was that was Alpha. Yeah, Monster Hunter Alpha. All right, now I'm going to be buying that when we're off this air. Okay. Okay. So what is it that you think really kind of makes this unique from different military fantasy novels? Hmm. Is hmm. it that you went and raided all the Eastern European <laughs> forests of darkness? You know, there, there's, there is a lot of, there's a lot of spec fic out there that, that takes place in like, kind of sort of not World War II or kind of sort of not Vietnam mm -hmm. and, and things like that. But, and there's hardly any that has the World War I vibe to it. You know, the, like Yeah, I the, think you got like you and Wonder Woman. Yeah, like the legit trench warfare type stuff. I mean, you know, there's there, there's a young adult author that did some stuff, Scott Westerfeld, um, Leviathan, I think was the first book. Um, he did a little bit of it too, but, you know, not this way, you know, not not pulling in like, you know, um, you know, the, the religion that we, the way we've done. So, yeah, we took a big religious angle on this one too. Cause we had like the whole, a whole church and myth where it's not kind of like, uh, the, the, the state religion is like a crash between Orthodox Christ, uh, Eastern Christianity, like colliding with like weird paganism with like mm -hmm. the three sisters and the three sisters is a kind of thing you can mm -hmm. see and a lot of mythology from all yeah. over the world, like, uh, you know, from Greece on, yeah. um, you know, and, and all the way, all, all the way over to England and Scotland and Ireland. And, uh, no, so we, we pulled that in. And, uh, so we had the, the, we had the angry gods fighting, yeah. uh, and, uh, one was really pissed off, <laughs> Yeah, but that's a spoiler. I won't get to her. <laughs> well, the, the whole, the whole idea there, taking some of that, and then we kind of threw a, like a Cain and Abel spin on it. And that's, you know, three sisters, two got pissed at one, ganged up and murdered the crap out of her. And that then, sounds like sisterhood. And then, and then they were like, well, crap, now we don't have someone to murder. So let's have an endless struggle against each other. We also connected, uh, one thing I think was kind of distinct was because this world that we created is its own distinct world, but it's connected to Earth. And so all the, every group of people that's in here, this is the world where all the fairy tale stuff in Earth comes from, except... Right. Fairy tale stuff could cross into our world and then go back. When humans would cross through the mists and wind up in this other world, they got stuck there. They couldn't come back. And so they just started to gradually settle and colonize the place. And so every group of people we have there uh, comes from a Earth, yeah. like a real-life group. I mean, so we have a lost tribe of Israel it has wandered in there at one point. Uh, that's where the golems come from. Because on that side, magic works really good. Yeah. So I'm assuming you're taking the Brothers Grimm style of fairy tales and not so much the Disney version. It's the very dark and twisty, horrible versions where, where if if you run across a fairy or a monster, it's going to eat you. Yeah, this ain't uh, this isn't like Tolkien uh, immortal pretty elves. 
This is like the steal your babies from the crib elves, you know. And we don't even actually deal with them because they're too alien. Yeah. We only see them. We only see them in the background in a few places. So it's so, dark fairy tales. So can you tell us a bit about the main character? Is the main character human or what? Oh, he's human. Well, uh, he's a he's a farm kid, basically. From the oh yeah, you already you mentioned that. I'm sorry. No, he's I from like, a big sleep last oh, night. That's right. He's like from the middle of nowhere, Siberia equivalent. He's just a miller. He's just a miller's kid. Uh, and um, everybody in his village is supposed to like everybody is supposed to enlist for mandatory, you know, mandatory conscription at 18 years old, like in the whole kingdom. And uh, they, he hasn't him and his buddy are, are 18 or he's actually like 21 and he's never enlisted because um, uh, his dad died. And so he's like the man of the family and their village is so far out there. They haven't even seen a tax collector in 20 years. So it's like the empires forgot about him. So he's like, ah, you know, I'm not, you know, he's getting, he's, he's in love. He's getting married. He's got his whole life ahead of him. He's, he's blind as a bat too. He can't see worth crap. Uh, so like him and his buddy are out hunting. He just, he gets the shotgun. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, he, he's a good kid though. He's a good, honorable dude. He's a hard worker and he's just, he's just, he, he's like the archetype trope of like the, the farm boy who, who has, who go, who gets sent on the great big adventure as he meets the recruiter slash Baba Yaga. <laughs> <laughs> so, so did you have any other tropes that you put into this story? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like all of them. Sure did. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Yeah, you know, one of the things we both really like doing is is putting putting well recognized tropes into stories, and then just effing with them, like, you know. So, which I mean, was your favorite one that you think you just kind of tortured with this? Oh, I I, I think it's the beginning. You know, we we start with the the farm boy who, you know, you, you expect that him and all of his little buddies and all the we introduce a few characters and it's like, oh, this is going to be the group. And then we kill everything. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then I, I think one of your favorites was like the trope of the whole righteous bastard thing. Oh yeah. Well, so we got a bastard character who uh, uh, he's just a he's a secret policeman. Yeah. And he's Steve's character. Steve like wrote all the scenes with this guy. Oh yeah. Like it's Kristoff. Uh, yeah. I mean, we yeah. Trope, that's a hell of a trope. Yeah. I mean, gosh, you, you see so many you see so many stories out there like the. The guy who's the villain who you think is going to become this really good guy at some point during the story. Now, the only reason this guy isn't the main villain of the book is because there's a worse guy. <laughs> I can understand that. There are some people who are like that. Yeah, but, so but, man, I love writing that character so much. You and your therapist have a lot to talk about, I bet. No, that's why he writes horror. It's his editor. That's, that character gets talked about like in the reviews and stuff more than anybody else. Oh, yeah. Because so, he like we introduce him and people think he's going to be like when you first see him he's doing horrible stuff as a secret policeman and people think he's going to be the main bad guy of the book no he's actually on the side of the of the heroes for now for now doing his own evil crap because his boss is so much worse we we just took you know rasputin and turned him up to 11. Ooh, i like that reference <laughs> go on so do you ever feel cheated, Larry? You mentioned the farm boy trope, and you've done that before. And having grown up on a farm, and you didn't get to do all those cool adventures, do you ever feel cheated when you write those? Whatever, I totally do cool adventures. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many cows he punched? Come on. Oh, I punched so many cows. Um, no, I uh, I actually, I love the farm boy trope because, like I said, I am a farm boy. And actually, it's funny because some of the best writing I've ever done was in Hard Magic when I just like talked about life on a dairy farm. That was autobiographical right there. <laughs> all, all, all those bits talking about how miserable it is. And the thing about being a writer, people talk about writing, writing is hard, whatever. Writing is not hard uh, because no matter how, what I do in my life, I just say, I'm not milking cows. And all of a sudden it's like way easier. So, so you don't follow the Iowa dairy farmer on TikTok then? It's well, hilarious. You guys, you guys both went to basic. And there's, there's like the, always the running <laughs> joke about the dairy farmer kid that's in basic. He's like, oh, I get to sleep in? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had that guy in my unit. Um, so this is, uh, we this talk is great. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he smokes all of us on the PT test. It just wasn't fair. He was born with an advantage. Um, the farm. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's, the like, cow it's, like, it's like having it's like having caveman gym fourteen hours a day, <laughs> your whole <Right>. life. <laughs> so, were there any secondary characters that that were in this book that were especially memorable to you guys? Oh, man. Other than your not evil villain hero. The bad guy light. The bad guy light. 
you know, that guy, that guy ended up becoming the main character. Um, <clears throat> probably because I had, I just had way too much fun writing him. Um, you know, there, there's a thing that happens when, when Larry and I write together, because we wrote a lot of short fiction together, um, back when I was first starting out. Um, and, and Larry, Larry had a couple books out. Um, so we've written quite a bit together now, but a lot of times what, what we found out is that like, I kind of know, I kind of know like the kind of like side tertiary secondary characters that Larry really likes. And so um, I introduced one in this. He's uh, he's basically the the guy who who uh, who builds bullet who who make who like you know uh, puts together the ammunition for all of the <clears throat> all the rifles and stuff for all of the snipers, and who invented one of the guns that that goes on the on the objects in it. And I and I wrote this character as just a throwaway, and, but as soon as I'd written the character, I thought, oh no no, Larry's gonna really like this character. And so I, so I introduced a couple places where he would show up again, so Larry could write more about. Him. Yeah, he's basically a little gun gnome, and I was like, yeah. oh, I'm all in. I'm yeah, all, yeah. I, I, I'll, I actually kind of made him kind of a kind of a father figure. Yeah, not, not father figure, but like, oh, well, kind of. Yeah, know? sorta. I, it's weird because like you'll have like these secondary and tertiary characters. We actually did a podcast on this. Yeah, and like what will happen is like all of a sudden they'll become like really cool, and like you'll be writing them, and it's like, wow, that guy was awesome. And the next thing you know, they're like a bigger character. And so like the tertiary characters become secondary characters. Yeah. Uh, One of my favorite characters on on um, the Arrow was like that. Smoke? Oh, yeah, yeah. She I only watched season one or two. I think. You're talking about Felicity Smoke? Yeah. yeah. Felicity Smoke and then um, the sister in Supergirl. Oh, which, ironically, both those characters were not in the comics. Right. They were put as secondary characters, and I actually became more invested in the char those characters than the other ones. Yeah, no, that's honestly that's a that's it, that's that's like fun, cool writing. If you if you get a secondary character, all of a sudden you care about that much. That's good. That's good work. Well, shoot, I remember I was reading I was reading Monster Hunter, Hunter Nemesis a while back when it first came out, um, and and that's where Larry really like really introduces the Vatican Combat Exorcists. Um, I mean, he introduced them in Alpha, but but you know, in Nemesis, when I when I saw one in action, uh, Guterres, I was like, man, this character is amazing. I love this character. And so when when Larry so uh, characters reminded me of the Adeptus Sororitas. Oh yeah, from Warhammer, mm -hmm. pretty cake. Oh, absolutely. And so when so when when Larry tapped me to write a story for the for the Monster Hunter Files anthology, I was like, whoa, I know what I'm doing. So, so I, I grabbed onto that character and made another, made another new one and, and, and wrote in that, I mean, secondary character, secondary tertiary characters who become just so much fun to write. I mean, I love that stuff. One yeah. of the things I like doing is when you talk to the various authors and at this point we're at episode about 140 or something like that. And you talk to authors, it always amazes me that some of the most popular fan characters are ones that were throwaways that no one ever, the authors never thought would be anything. And suddenly they become something because the fans care. Yep. So that, that always amuses me. It's like, they were just like, they filled a purpose in the plot and they were, that was it. That was all they were supposed to do. So Speaking of purposes in the plot, uh, does your character, can you tell us about the bad guy they have to confront without spoilers? Or is the answer going to blow too much? Because we don't want to spoil it. We want them to read your book. Multiple, no. multiple yeah. levels of bad guys. Um, <laughs> the yeah. human bad guy, actually, it was interesting. So we wrote the rough draft. So we brainstormed, we wrote the rough draft. Then we actually reconvened and had a big meeting one day, a big lunch meeting, yeah. to mostly go over the big bad guy's motivations yeah. and like why he was doing what he was doing. Uh, and then we came back and rewrote it for the final. And man, he got so much more evil. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, I think, you know, I, I like having bad guys at varying levels and varying complexities, because what it does is it just it, it it allows you to to just completely mess with your characters on different levels. You know, some some are just a bad guy that that prevent them from, you know, progressing a little bit in life or whatever. And then there's ones that it's like, oh, this dude's gonna kill you. And then there's the bad guys. It's like, well, this person will end your entire existence because it's a god. Yeah. And right. and that's pretty much the levels that we have. I mean, we have these. Well, we got these the, sister the gods. Cute, yes, we got the gods who are just like one they're of them. horrible. They're horrible. They're horrible to each other and horrible to their people. Uh, but then we have like the human bad guy um, who basically wants to invade hell 
to steal all the souls of the damned to power magical super weapons. Yeah. I mean, as you do on a Saturday that night. that sounds safe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's the second tier villain. Yeah. <laughs> if that's second tier, I hate to see, so, see what so the next clearly, tier clearly, you gentlemen have outdone yourselves on evil villains. And speaking <laughs> of evil villains, JR tried to steal my question, my favorite question. And I'm stealing it back because I caught him. If your characters found you in a back alley, oh no, what would they do if they knew you two were the ones who put them through all that? Oh, jeez, oh, we get our butts kicked so hard. Oh, um, <laughs> so, depends on which character. Natalia so they, would kill us. She'd so, just shoot us. So Natalia would kill us from a distance. She's yeah. a sniper. Yeah, we'd enter the alley and then like we'd catch a bullet from like 500 yards from the shadows. So Alarian, so. who's the main good guy, he'd probably he probably like. He'd probably give us a hug and say, do better next time. Yeah, he's actually <laughs> a, a good kid. He's a good kid, yeah. He'd probably ask us to read something for him because um, he doesn't know how to read. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Kristoff, we'd probably get knifed and left to monsters. Whatever. He'd, like, try to steal her earthly, or, earthly secrets. Or and... he'd say, we did such a good job that he'd recruit us. At least me. Or he, <laughs> I, I, I'm I, not sure you want to be recruited by <laughs> Probably he'd get to Earth, he'd steal my credit card, use it to buy a bunch of AK 47s and ship them back to Colacovia for to, to win the war. Yeah. So and then he'd yeah. say he invented them to take all the credit. Yeah. Recruit right. the Krasnovian army to take out the bad guys. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling what you're picking up. Buzz it up. Pick it up what you're putting down. Yeah. So that that's probably what would happen. So half of them would kill us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the, okay. the fourth character who's kind of sort of secondary slash main. Oh, he'd be Amos. He, Amos would be actually he. I don't know what he would do. He'd be okay. He's, he'd, I mean, he's all about forgiveness. Yeah, he, we actually have a character who's basically a Jewish rabbi yeah. uh, slash wizard. <laughs> we, have, we have a rabbinical wizard. Uh, he's actually a really nice guy, though. I think we'd be okay with him. Yeah, he'd probably just yeah. ask if we could find a quiet place for him to go He'd home. be like, why? <laughs> what is wrong <laughs> with you? Why can you not oh, use your powers for good? Fair. Okay, like, so how how are we looking for time on your end? Because we've got some that are just fun questions we can cut if we need to. No, okay. you guys keep going. I, I, yeah. I, I'll just I gotta drive. I, we're in Steve's office because we were recording episodes of Writer Dojo right before this, and I was gonna go home to do this, and there's just no way I was gonna make it. Kind of about forty five minutes away, so I was just we're we're sitting here in Steve's office yeah. uh, to do. That's why we're together. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm good. I'll just drive home whenever. Yeah, we're good. All right, Doc. Okay, so. Do you guys have a favorite archetype that you like to write? Ooh. I don't know. I like a yeah. lot of them. I uh, think Larry's favorite archetype is women who shoot amazingly well. <laughs> I have one of those in that in this book. Oh, you have one for a daughter. I do actually, yeah. My, yeah no. I have two that are actually pretty solid. Don't don't get in a gunfight with either of my kids. Uh, I think the first post I ever read from you was of you bragging about your daughter just absolutely smoking these guys. So when you're you talking, funny. I actually have several book series where I have a female marksman character. I have one. In I the know. Side. I pay attention. No, so, I, so your kids is it like long arms or is it pistols? Pistols primarily pistols. with my girls. Oh, then I'm in, I'm hosed. I, I went through the pistol course, and they told me I'd be better off throwing the pistol at the bad guys than shooting them <laughs> with it. Now, give me a rifle. I could do amazing things. But. All right, so, so while Steve thinks of his archetype, real quick story, the one the, one the doc's sister is talking about. Okay, so what it was is I, I had my my older daughter at the range. She's shooting a 1911. It's her, it's her 1911. Um, and we live next to an Air Force base, or we used to find Air Force base, and so we're at the indoor range there. And uh, this young guy comes in, high and tight. He's got a bread of 92. So obviously this is an airman. And he's got an old guy coaching him. And the, and the old guy's got some sort of Eastern European accent. The old guy's giving this guy coaching. And so my daughter's setting up her target. And stuff and stuff. Well, the young guy, the Air Force guy, looks at my daughter. And he, he, he didn't mean to be rude, but he kind of sneered at her. Because at the time, she's like 15, 16 years old. And he kind of sneered at her like, oh, she's a little girl. Doesn't she know that handgun shooting is hard? And he's got a tie his target about 10 yards, and he's got a group about, you know, this big, okay? It's like, a, you know, not a good group. Like, he's barely keeping them in a – yeah, it, it's, they're not all in a B8, you know what I mean? And He's so, proving that chair force works. Yeah, so <laughs> – and he's getting coached, and he's kind of sneers at my daughter. My daughter catches the sneer, and she looks at him like, oh, yeah? So she runs her target out to 10 yards, 
and then like six more inches. All right, so it's just farther than his. Like, see, we was like, murk, murk. <laughs> then she gets out her 1911, she's loading up, then she goes, Dad, I'm going to practice Mozambique drills. That's two to the body, one to the head. And I was like, okay. And she just goes, boom, 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 boom. And she just started drilling, and then she's like, reloads, and she's just doing it. And she's just drilling and just, like, cutting the eye box out of this dude, right? And she gets done, and she just, like, looks over at the young guy, and the young guy is looking at her like, <laughs> and he's just Sassy. all falling. I like it. But this little 16-year-old girl's kicking the crap out of him. And uh, <laughs> so the old guy that was coaching him looks at me and just goes, good job, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was so funny. Oh, that's proud of her. All right, so archetypes, yeah. Gosh, you know, I don't know. I <sighs> I love I love riding dirt bags. That's probably it for me. I love, <laughs> Look, you've got a lot in this book. I, I love writing dirt bag characters. Um I, I just do. Because because they get a you know, it, it's kind of the, the very Machiavellian type where where as long as they get the job done, it's good. That's it. And so I, I love writing those types of characters. So on a scale of zero to Joel Abercrombie, and then at the far end would be like George R. R. Martin. How dark is this novel? Ooh. So uh uh it's it's not it's not Joe Abercrombie or Mark Lawrence. Um okay. it was, but we pulled it back. Yeah, you were probably at least Prince of Thorns dark. I was yeah. definitely you you were actually darker. I was I was darker than Prince of Thorns. I was probably darker than 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 um Blade itself overall. Yeah. Um but uh I mean yeah, yeah, we were there originally because because our Kristoff was very much the Glotka character from 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 uh from first law trilogy. Only not all physically jacked. But up. just not physically jacked. Um but uh we we ended up pulling it back in a few places um so that it wasn't like super grim dark um if if joe abercrombie's like an eight then um this is probably a six yeah okay yeah, i guess because like martin I, I think is just i don't i don't i don't it's just so nihilistic yeah so we're not nihilistic though because we still no. like because most of the books through the perspective of a guy who is legit a hero uh, yeah, you know, I I learned a lot from from an author named uh, um, Joe Lansdale, who's one okay. of my, my favorite authors and people everywhere. Um, and he said that, especially for novels, that that your horror doesn't mean anything unless there's light to counterbalance it. And so, um, so we we take that tactic a lot. And frankly, that's that's what Bane readers like anyway. You know, they they need they need heroes and they need they need hope. Um, or at least the prospect of hope. And so that's that's very much what this is. Yeah, so we get pretty pretty friggin' dark, but we also have the main character. We go back to a guy who actually is the best of them. He's, or he's, he's trying to be the best he, of them. He is a good, good guy. He's a good guy. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I love Abercrombie. I love Mark Lawrence. You know, I was a big R. Scott, I was a big R. Scott Baker fan. Um, I, I've read all that stuff. I love all that stuff. You know, Glenn Cook. Um, the biggest compliment someone gave us is when they said, this is like Glenn Cook. I'm like, yeah, heck yeah, it is. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I love all that stuff. But I think we're getting to a point in time right now where that's all fine and dandy. But I kind of want to have David Gemmel heroes again. So yeah. that's my that's my opinion. Yeah, because then like some of Black Sword, my series is like it's, it, I get, it, it gets called Gemmel-esque. That's a massive compliment. And that's a massive compliment. I, I think that's a huge compliment. So yeah. I know during uh the recent unpleasantness as I've taken to calling it, I went for very what I call popcorn books for at one point. Yeah, sure. Because they're just light and fun. Yep. Uh, I I listened to Tom Stranger enough Audible gave me a badge for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should be a little manatee. Should be like yeah. a little manatee i don't know i i balance the reading the <laughs> when you read a book so many times on audible they give you a badge for like repeat listening of the same book i didn't know that was a thing okay um yeah i, I, try I to like balance. my achievements leave me alone no it's fine gamification of reading i'll take it 
I, I balance reading the the light and fluffy because you know life sucks and I don't need to suck it in a book. But I also like reading some of the dark stuff, so that way I'm like, well, you know, all these bad things that happened to me overseas. At least I didn't, you know, have a dragon eat my friend or, or whatever. I, right? I did that during my divorce. I watched a lot of stuff, and I was like, look, at least my life's not that crazy. <laughs> the, yeah, the funny so, thing is, is for me, the horror stuff is the fun stuff. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like yeah, let's do this. I, I can um, see him at a book signing. Write what you know. That's why I write horror. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I've used that line so many times in panels. That's awesome. They're, they're, Cause that was like, seriously, that was one of the worst pieces of advice I ever received when I was, when I was a young author, I thought, I thought, yeah, right. What you know? Well, what do I know? Accounting? It sucks. <laughs> oh, come on. My favorite accountant is the werewolf accountant in Larry's books. Or rather the combat accountant who kills well, the werewolf. I, mean, I started that, out when I, I wrote out careers. guns and accounting. I mean, that's literally our careers. <laughs> That was my career. You know, we, 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 we worked together for, for uh, doing accounting for, for DOD. But um, but no, inevitably, someone on, on some panel is like, so Steve, why do you write horror? And I'm like, because it's fun. And, and they're not satisfied with that answer. That's not good enough. I think I said, well, you know. And so that's when I always say, well, you know, I was given advice early on because they're like, man, you write a lot of really violent stuff, Steve, a lot of torture and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I do. Because I was told to write what you know. And then, you know, <laughs> depending on the person, I either get a laugh or they turn around and walk away from me and then I never hear from them again. It's a I one. actually knew a horror author one time who went, because I'm a sick puppy. That works, because it's cheaper than therapy. I well, get what, it. Is it, what is it that you say about me, Larry? It's the, it's oh, a getting out of good childhood or something? Yeah, and actually, because I originally brought this line off of what Mike said about Taylor, but uh -huh. it was like, Steve is one cigarette being put out on his skin away from being a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, so I'm really super glad that Steve's parents are really nice people. That you know of. Have you checked their basement? If Steve has great parents, if Steve had had like a terrible childhood, dude, if we flipped and you had my childhood. Oh, dude, I would have killed so oh, many people. Oh, he, Steve, Steve would, have already, Steve would have already capped a lot of dudes. A lot of people. But no I wouldn't doubt. be in prison. Don't worry about that. No, he'd be, he'd be fine. But I say if, <laughs> if we flip childhoods. Yeah, actually, if we had flip childhood, I'd probably be police chief oh in some, some small town. You would totally be, be a cop. I would because I tried to do that anyway. Yeah. And then you friggin' would be out there like work. You'd be a hitman for the mafia. Probably. Seriously. He, he'd be <laughs> like. <laughs> You're probably right. Yeah. Or you'd be working for like a Mexican drug cartel. You're fluent in Spanish. That's legit. Like he, his Spanish is perfect. So he'd be working for like Rosetas right now or whatever. That's legit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be poisoning people's coke stashes. So it would be kind of like the. And when I was stationed at Fort Bliss in Juarez, there were. Many of the people who worked for some of the senior management of the cartels lived in Juarez and these oh, for, sure. uh, in, for in Juarez, but lived in El Paso in these very yeah. um, palatial, pretty places. Like mm -hmm. seriously, one of them looked like it was a mini water park. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I yeah, never thought of that before, but I'm glad. I mean, if we flipped childhoods, we this would turn out a lot different. <laughs> yeah. so what I'm getting from Larry and Steve and Doc is that we clearly went into the wrong line of work. All right. So, oh, I already so, could have told you I went into the wrong line of work. So I keep making was, the bad choice. So we've talked a little bit about the world, but is there anything about the world that we haven't talked about that you think is germane for our listeners? Because in many stories, the worlds where they take place are as much a character as the protagonist and the antagonist. So was there anything else you wanted to cover? Boy, you know, I, I think that that's true for this world too. I mean, in, in many ways, Larry and I are trying to create a world that feels that feels very authentic and lived in. Um, you know, I, I was watching the Wheel of Time series on Amazon. I suffered through it. And uh, and the the entire world, for some reason, I don't know if it's the way it's shot or whatever, but it all feels it all feels so sanitized. Um, it feels it feels like no one's lived in too that world. Clean. Yes. Yeah, everything's too clean. Um, like, like it just, it just doesn't feel right where, you know, you, you see something like the Witcher and everything's pretty dark, pretty gritty. And you're like, yeah, yeah. A dude totally died in that, in that alley that the guy just passed. Like, like this totally happened. What'd you hear on that? Henry Cavill, like they do makeup there. He'd be dirty and they put a little dirt on his face and he goes, no, that's not right. He'd go roll in the mud. Like in costume, he'd like literally go roll around. I love that man so hard. And then he'd be all filthy and be like, okay, this is good. Yeah, you know, I, having been on some really long road marches carrying a lot of heavy stuff, like 
sweats has a way of changing the way your clothes look and texture and smell and and the way it reflects the light. I mean, like all of that is real and you never like no farm boys ever that clean. No. And, and what I hope people see when they, when they read this is they see just, they see this, this giant world that we've created and, and the influences that it's pulled from other places. But I hope they also see that, man, we barely scratched the surface on it. So, okay. So uh, right now, Servants of War stands alone, but it sounds like there's more coming. So is that a correct assumption that, that more will be coming from these characters? If, if you guys buy it, if people buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If people buy it. Larry, yeah, how many Dragon Awards do you have? Oh, wait. wait. Uh, four. Uh, but but that said, that said, I, it's also competing with all my other stuff. So it's all if, if it's all up in six months, Tony Weisskopf comes to me and goes, yeah, that was good, Larry. You should do some more of those. And I'm then we're all in. We've got like a ton more we would totally do. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, they can, they can vote with their pocketbooks. Yes, I do have, I do, I, I believe I hold the, I believe I hold the world record for dragons right now. Yes, you do. Which is ironic because I keep telling my fans to not nominate me. But if it's a collaborative novel, that would be really unfair to my Heck co-authors. Yeah. I'd be a total That's dick if right. I did that. So. That's right. Yeah. I think he's okay with the world being unfair. Yeah, I'm definitely okay with it. Okay, so if it's a Larry Korea only novel, I'm okay. I got mine. Share the love with other authors, seriously. But if it's a collaborative novel, I would be a dick if I said that. So, like, if you like the book, vote That's for right. it. And, and Steve would. Uh, I, I have one with John Ringo and I have one with John Brown. So, so like, <laughs> yeah. And they hear, I hear when you and get you your first novel, Larry. they give you a second mountain and two castles. No, no, we don't. That's true. You know, I mean, the, Larry got forward. He no. bought a mountain with a castle on it. So I, I'm thinking it's only getting better from there. Look, the, the more we sell, the more bunkers and stuff that Larry can make. And this is important. Hey, if I saw. Wait, 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 wait. Is he going to populate them with pano novels? I know people who are waiting outside to know if this is true, Ooh. if he's going to buy more pano novels, because if so, they won't buy the book. I, um, I don't know if we sell another hundred thousand copies, I might be able to buy a case of five, five, six ammo, <laughs> or a tank of gas, at least three, bullets. or fill your car. No, or fill, or fill my car. I could, I could, I could drive my truck back and forth once to yes. town. So, so we know that every literary unit has their own internally consistent rules of technology and magic. Um, so, what sort of tech or magic can we expect from these books? Oh yeah. Oh, this was big. Oh, oh yeah. We did a bunch of this because I'm a nerd for this kind of stuff on world building. So like one of the big things is like we wanted to I wanted to get the feel of like a tank crew uh, working Ooh. together and so what it was is the, but they they don't have tanks they have these suits made out of dead golems so they get golem fragments and the way magic works in this uh, is so golems real golems only one group of people can make them but they're basically super weapons they're like weapons of mass destruction but if they kill a golem on the battlefield they can get the phrase off it and they can break it into parts and use those little parts power these basically suits these big steampunk suits yeah so a big part of the technology of the book is those uh, so they're magically powered walking fighting suits and they have they have basically like these they're supposed to have like 10 man crews but they're always so short-handed they usually are running with like five or six um but what, that sounds the, right. the way the magic works is the more the the more the suit works and the more damage it takes from like bullets and fragments the hotter it gets so there's one dude right inside and, but the heat just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and they start to cook. They get third degree burns, and so when they're getting cooked and they're they're just gonna pass out, they uh, they stop the line, they pop the hatch, pull the half dead driver out, throw in a bucket of water, and then they throw in the next guy, like reload the guns and just keep fighting, and they just turn them. And uh, like and the rest of the crew, their job is to like keep the robots, well not robots, the the suits, the objects from falling over because they're kind of clumsy. And so they're walking through these blasted battlefield. There's been shell, there's craters, there's barbed wire. Yeah. And and so the whole crew, rest of the crew, they don't even get guns. The rest of the crew, they have shovels, pry bars, chains, uh, and they're getting shot at. There's explosions going off. And they're up there like, hey, I got to move this board. <laughs> so that's yeah. how you can tell that someone knows nothing about the military when they write units where everybody's fully staffed. 
Because that just oh, doesn't happen. Gosh, yeah. These guys aren't stacked. No, these guys are hosed continually. And they get treated like garbage, too, because, it's, you know, it's an it's a Eastern European-style army. So it's very much – it's like, oh, you know, just uh, just just push through there with your courage. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay if you die, just don't lose your shovel. Oh, yeah, because he's issued a shovel. The shovel is, like, way more valuable than his life. At one point, he finally gets to drive the suit, and it's like – Take care of my shovel. <laughs> I, mean, I, I remember a long ago getting that same lecture from my chef about, very my, accurate. about his coffee pot. So I understand the struggle. He oh, told yeah. me he could have more kids, but coffee pots were expensive. Yeah, I know. At one point, like they're they're scavenging corpses, and they come up with a come up with a knife, uh, like just a combat knife off one of the enemy, and it's like this is a prize because now all of a sudden I got, I have a good knife now. Yeah, you know, I can actually, I actually have a knife in case the enemy closes with us. Yeah, yay! And yeah, and so, so we take full advantage of that in the story. All those, all those, like the the scarcity is a big uh, deal in this book. Yeah. So of all, like of all the tech and magic that you put together, which one would you want to have for daily use in our world? Uh oh, the horror writer is going to give us something. Yeah. Right? Honestly, honestly, I don't want any. I, I would not no. want anything from this world in our. Well, because there's magic, but it's Larry's not. like hard pass. Just no. No, you you don't want you want no part of this. Okay, because basically, so we didn't get to this part, but basically, the power source for all the magic is dead people. Yeah, it's um, it's it's souls. It's and the souls. Yeah, the bad people are like taking human souls and just basically chopping them up and using them to power different things yeah you're so yeah there there, there is there is no good tech and i mean yeah so the bad <laughs> guys are harvesting ghosts yeah so we've got we've had doc we've had 175 episodes when we were sci-fi shenanigans this is episode 131 and in all of those episodes i don't think anyone said nope i don't want any of it leave it there i mean that is well, the first <laughs> you want nothing to do with this 300 yeah. episodes, and you guys are the first who are like, yeah, no, hard yeah, pass. No, no, these no. Guys, these guys, are, they've had a hundred, they've had, they've had a century of warfare, because basically both kingdoms are like, hey, dead people are great, because then we get to do more magic. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, so we've got, we've got dead people magic, we've got gas that dissolves your skin, we've got... Um, we can make, I can make gas that dissolves but your skin here. Uh, uh, if you're yeah. listening, Susan with Jicky Jicky over on uh, YouTube's or whoever runs Anchor, she's talking hypothetically. Uh, Mr. FBI man, we're 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 just this is theoretical. I'm just I saying mean, there's, it's yeah, there's there's nothing good. I mean, and some of that some of that same tech goes to like basically turn corpses into monsters. Well yeah, they, they actually they 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 use the same technology to take basically uh the Dude's dead and dying together, and yeah. then turn them into battlefield implements. So like there's so, there's nothing good. Yeah, so like honestly, in this world, like there, there's like there's there's no Hogwarts and my, there's no Hufflepuffs. Okay, you gotta understand, my my mom, my mom likes everything, you know, jelly beans and rainbows and and unicorns and stuff like that, and uh, and and she goes, she knows what I write. She doesn't read a lot of it. She reads some of it. She doesn't read all of it, but she goes, she goes, okay, well, so is this gonna be your happy book? I said, I don't think so. Um, She's like, well, is there any happiness in it? And I said, well, the main character learns how to read at one point. <laughs> that's, that's that's pretty happy. He had a good day. <laughs> there's there's a puppy. There's there's a yeah. There's Who a eats puppy. the puppy? Come on, I'm getting this feeling. The, it, it eats a person, but there's a puppy. <laughs> your mom? Does your mom ever go? What did I do wrong? You know. Uh, I don't think I mean, so. I think she I'm worried. a mom and I ask that constantly and my kid doesn't even write for her yet. <clears throat> you know, my 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 dad my dad the other day asked me why he's like, wait, you listen to metal music? I'm like, well, yeah. And he's like, when did that happen? How did that happen? And then my mom is asking me, you know, like she's like, Why man, you write a lot of really dark stuff. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like it, like where did this coming from? Where does this come from? Oh, like Harris Red Servants War yet? No. <laughs> no. Metal can mean a lot of things to a lot of people because at one point in time, like Pearl Jam and Guns N' Roses was considered heavy metal, and now it's like light rock. Oh, so no. I don't where listen. are you defining? 
I don't listen to that crap. No. I'm okay. Not. We're talking. I, I prefer things like, um, uh, like Camelot. Um, when 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 we were when we were doing the draft of this book, I, I have to have music on when I write. I have to, or I get nothing done. And so um, the bands that helped me get through this book were um, uh, Tremonti, who I just saw um, live the other day. He was, he was freaking rad. Camelot, Catatonia, um, Epica, and let's see who else. Um, oh, and, and Disturbed, of course. Of course. Okay. All right. So, so we're gonna we're gonna have a hard pivot because uh, I don't know how we come back from that. But uh, so true. we we've established that your your novel has um, sort of fantastical creatures, and it applies if you're writing aliens too. So how do you go about creating them? Do you let your nightmares uh, inspire you? Get too much I think like that's secondary. What inspired all of the book. Yeah, I mean, was it like secondary drug high from your metal concerts? Like, where do no. you guys come oh, up with gosh. these ideas? I, I just love monsters. Um, the the monsters, the actual monster monsters that are, that are in this book, I think I did all of them. You kid, you you kid. Well, I, I t actually I did one thing that was darker. I made the bird things at the end. Grosser. You did that. That was grosser. It was way gr what I so Steve had these really monstrous bird thing when they're in hell. Yeah, they, they go to hell at one point. Um, they march through hell, and that's a hell of a road march. And um, they, yeah, it's pretty. Um, so Steve had these bird monsters at one point when you finally, cause they're circling above and then finally when they get close, they're really, they were horrific. I made them worse. Yeah. That's yeah. proud of you. Yeah. That was actually really gross. That was actually a full on monster hunter moment. I was like, I was like, these, these bird things are awful and terrifying, but they need to be grosser. And yeah. so, yeah, they, they did. They got grosser. Yeah. I, I like taking things that seem like they should be normal. And then I, uh, I make them really, really gross and weird. And then I try to, to even make them worse, if that's a word. Um, now you're an author. I know, right? I can do what I want. Yeah. Um, Professional word people. So, yeah, I, I love I love doing really weird, gross, creepy things. And then and then just and well, then just twisting them even more. Like the most like most straightforward monster we had was probably the ghouls. Like because yeah, like, that was like a traditional, like all every folklore has got some sort of subterranean humanoid yeah, yeah. that eats dead people kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But we actually use that quite a bit in this book as like a way that they basically like the criminal underworld just gets rid of bodies. Yeah. Like like basically you well, don't that that was kind of from like Deadwood, where 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 Swearingen would would get rid of bodies using the pigs. That, that's totally where I got it from, but but yeah. but with ghouls. It's like if, and actually we actually added some religious stuff because like if you don't want somebody to get eaten by ghouls, you have to perform like some religious rites yeah. over them for consecrated ground. Otherwise, yeah, you just leave a. If you want a body taken care of, just leave it out. It'll be gone in the morning. <laughs> so speaking of eating horrific things, how do you feel about pineapples on pizza? I'm okay with it actually. I, I figures the genocidal Krasnovian would be. <laughs> okay, here's what you got to understand about Larry. Larry likes everything. Yeah, I'm the worst person to ask food. None of my friends will listen to no, me on food. No, no, because he, he thinks all food is great. Now, that's wrong. So, it's, uh, no. To be fair, okay, in my defense, what it is is I'm actually kind of a foodie. And so I will go to like Michelin-starred restaurants. But for lunch, I will eat at a taco truck. You know, in the worst part of town that has roaches running across. I'm like... Hey, this looks added good. protein. Added protein. I, I'm utter, I'm actually kind of I'm, I'm not I want to say completely fearless because there is some food that I just can't do. But I, will, I'm, sushi? That, no. I'm that guy, and so I, I realized a couple years ago that none of my friends will trust me on food. They'll be like, "Hey, this place opened up. Is it any good?" I'll be, like, "Oh yeah, it's great." And I'll look at no somebody other than Larry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but wait, I think somebody once told me you put Pepsi in your. Diet Pepsi in your horchata? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Coke horchata. Yeah. <laughs> what is, it? What is that? That's years. actually pretty good. Yeah, see? I was I mean, I've had I've had a pep I've had a horchata latte. That was banging. Yeah. No. I make I make Coke Chata and now that I drink diet, Coke Chata Zero. That's right. What is a chata? I, I'm I'm totally Oh lost. god, you are so Anglo. Oh man. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm paler than the sun. So basically, so. think of it as liquid churro in a cup. That's yeah. totally okay. what shop is. Okay. Yeah. It's awesome. It's, it's, awesome. It's, it's, it's the main ingredients are 
right uh rice water, rice water brown sugar vanilla cinnamon though i use almond milk in mine and lower the amount of sugar yeah. i use brown sugar when i make it at home yeah. and almond milk yep as well as the rice milk because it puts less sugar in it so it's well, a little healthier i put it this way i've tried like every every kind of ethnic food there is on earth that i can like think of like if, if there's a restaurant somewhere in america dedicated to some like 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 why is it well, all of larry's friends he's I mean, larry's yeah. like, none of my friends wanted me to pick the place and i'm like let's go let's go yeah i'm uh, good so, i'm good with whatever like i'll try anything yeah so so pineapple on a pizza like that's that's like last resort pizza fair um now if you remove that and instead you place jalapenos on it then you're then we're talking god's food yeah okay. well jared wants to put pistachio nuts on it I don't That's know where right. you get this crazy idea from, Doc. So, so speaking of food, be before we wrap this up, did you actually include any of your foodie stuff in this novel, Larry and Steve? No. Not, this, not this No one has food. I know. It's like, here's your potato. They're, they're ration lines. <laughs> okay. So they had liquid potatoes. Okay. I'm, I'm a good yeah, Oh, there is actually a lot of drinking. I mean, they There's, drink a lot. That's about the only consistent thing within the book. That they well, because if they don't, basically, it's like, it's like, it's, it's like they, they just keep plenty of alcohol. Because the water, the water is all crap, too. And so they drink a lot of booze. And plus, it keeps its rebellion down. To be fair, that's how it was when I lived in Mexico. So. Okay. Or any army base, you know, we just drink a lot of stuff. We actually, we actually do have plan for the sequels. Yeah, should that, should, uh, should we get to do? Yeah. Or they go to the other country and they're like, holy crap! What you just buy food at a store? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. They just buy food? Outstanding, outstanding. <laughs> I'm gonna definitely. In fact, I was to type in the doc in the side chat. They were definitely gonna have to get this book and do a book review on it because I'm, I'm interested. Wait. I don't think they have any audiobooks, so JR, you're gonna have to brush up on your oh, it's, it's audio. Yeah, it's an audio. It's, it's an audio? I have not listened to it yet, even. I have not had a chance. Maybe, maybe that's what Audible was trying to tell me when they told me I had a new book downloaded. <laughs> oh, cool. So yeah, there are uh, some people who I have on like just auto buy, like Faith Hunter. I love Faith. Uh, it's great. It's great. I, I I when Audible did their 85% off sale. Uh, right yeah that that was dangerous i bought so many things in my, I bought, commute, in my commute's less than 10 minutes i bought all of soul win and finished it in less than a month i bought about half of the jane yellow rocks and then i decided since i hadn't even started soul Wind, i should at least see if i like it before <laughs> i buy all of them well faith, uh, faith is awesome faith is super cool yeah faith i, I really want to meet her one day one day you haven't met uh, faith oh well, I've probably run into her. I panel a lot of people at Dragon Con, but paneling somebody at Dragon Con and actually sitting down and talking to them at Dragon Con are you're, two you're different. Really, you're really running there. She's she's a sweetheart. She's really nice. But uh, like, she's on my auto buy. You are. Uh, Davis Asura is Robert Ross. Um, cool. Other ones. Yeah, I I have a list. I, I don't even like almost anything Nick Podell narrates. Jay Boyce writes. Yeah, All of them just seem to automatically end up in my. Yeah, this this narrator is not one that Larry's had before. No, it's a new narrator for me. I've actually not had him before, but he did all the CJ Cherry's books. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, so far, uh, everyone says that he's done a great job. Yeah. So the narr So, like I said, I haven't got to listen to it yet. Um, I'm but too nervous too. Well, I know. That's because you don't have a commute. I have PTSD. Well, no, I have PTSD from from residue. Um, they they just picked the wrong reader for it. Um, he, he, I listened to his stuff on other things and he did a great job, but on mm -hmm. my book, it was just a miss. Um, and the, it was actively hurting my reviews. So like, like it was hurting sales. And so I, I ended up pulling it. So now I'm, I'm on the lookout for someone who I can pay to read this thing. Well, and like, on um, for me, I, I'm currently working on the, on number four on the son of the black sword. Right. Sorry, I forgot where I can't listen to my audio books of a different series while working in a different series that's that makes sense. i can see that it causes too much brain shift yeah because each of my series is really different as far as tone mm -hmm. and voice uh so i have to finish this book i'm on then i can listen to something else yeah otherwise i get all screwed up and all of a sudden next thing you know all my characters who are indian start talking with you know polish accents that would be awkward i mean i might pay to see it but that would be awkward Ashok gets a shovel and a potato. So, <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> my my Irish and Scottish ancestors are down with a potato if we get a little steak to go with it that we steal from the English. Um, so clearly this interview is winding down um, and Doc's going to fall asleep here soon. But was there anything about Servants of War that you wanted to tell us that we didn't ask before we wrap this up? Man, just freaking buy it and read it. Hope people like it. Yeah, Check it out. I, I, I think people are really going to like it. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, it's it's awesome. The reviews are excellent. Actually, the reviews are really, really good. Yeah, really, really good. Well, yeah. your commercial that you play on your writer's dojo is what set, made me reach out to do this interview. So if it's anything as good as that that audio commercial, like people are going to dig it. So yeah, awesome. yeah, Jack Jack read that. Jack did an awesome job on that. So, but, Jack uh, did a pretty quality. awesome job on oh, pretty much yeah. Oh, so, so so our podcast would be utter crap if it wasn't for him. In fact, he almost died. In, in fact, it was utter crap for about three episodes. He he, Jack got COVID real bad, about died. He he got really really yeah. sick, and uh, yeah, yeah. He he, and so we we Steve <laughs> tried to tackle all the the editing and producing. While it was bad news bears all over. Like it was it was rough. Everybody's like, "Wow, your sound is all stupid and terrible and bad this time. What's wrong with you?" Sorry, you're so amateur. It's like sorry. My bad. Jack's in the hospital. We suck. Our sound, our sound guy's almost dead, so Steve had to fill in. Oh, and he's not dead. That's the main part. <laughs> no, 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 no. JR, we let J we let the numb nuts who's colorblind do all the, and brain damage do all the editing. And hard of hearing. Who knew getting blown up a bunch of times was bad for your hearing? <laughs> so, but this is... <laughs> so, the VA says you're fine. Just change your socks and take some Motrin. That's right. Not service connected. Those 27 IEDs had nothing to do with your health conditions. Uh, my favorite was the neurologist that tried to tell me the brain damage was all in my head. And I'm like, you think? Yeah. <laughs> Where but, else? Uh, you must my foot, doctor. <laughs> he didn't last very long at the VA. The, the Vietnam vets are sometimes very colorful in their um, voicing their opinions on certain staff members. Sure. So if you upset them, it tends to they tend not to stick around a good, so, a good a good friend of mine a good friend of ours works at the va and he's got he's actually got a really hard job it's, they do yeah so, it, he's he's stuck between a rock and a hard place working for the government it's it's the government so i feel bad for the dude he tries he works really hard but i play but, with chemicals for a reason so one of the things that Larry mentioned is that to determine whether they're going to write a book two is how much book one sells. But once, uh, in addition to buying the book, one way you can help the authors is to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. Even a bad review can sell somebody if it's like, oh, I don't like this too much guns. I'm like, dude, sign me up. My favorite review was for one of mine, but was a 12 year old with ADHD wrote gun porn. I'm like, Oh, freaking standing. Can I use that as ad copy? So, you know, obviously we like good reviews, but reviews in general help. So do your thing, people. Hey, my, right. I actually picked up a book because they went, it's a Laurel K. Hamilton book, her new one. And somebody, and a review went, not enough sex. I went, okay, that sounds like I really could read this at work. Well, you blurred. Did you see that I'm the back cover blurb for that? Yes, I, I did. did. We're going to do a review episode I, on that one. I yeah. got to read, I got to read the very first early, early rough draft. Yeah, well, I, I thought it was really good, and I could definitely see knowing you and having read both your works, I could see some of your influence with it. No, I loved it. I thought it was great. And like you said, she basically what she was is – and so, yeah, it's not as sexy as Anita Blake because, you know, that, that freaks out a lot of people. Uh, but so she wanted to go more with this series, more like original, the first few Anita Blake books where it was – a little more. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I like Anita Blake and I've read all of them, but there is something really special about some of the early novels of Anita Blake. My mom also used to send me to school with like guilty pleasures and made sure that my teachers knew I was reading it. Yeah. So I was actually really, I was, I was actually pretty honored when she was it's like, actually, read the it's early not as bad. Oh, Steve yeah. is making a face, but guilty pleasures is very, very tame. <laughs> it's just the name because the names are all about locations. So I I, 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 I enjoyed it. So, so that will be uh, coming up soon as a book review episode that we're going to do. But uh, as we bring this home and I'd like to actually review this book because it sounds outstanding. We just got to get Nick to actually read again. But uh, Steve Diamond, can you tell listeners how they can find you? And as usual, it will be in the show notes. Yeah. You know, I, I think the best place is to, if you actually want to get in touch with me and have me respond, um, grab, just grab me on Facebook or on Twitter um, that's probably the easiest ways. So uh, you're the, you're the Facebook face because we know Larry gets banned. 
I'm probably banned at any given. I'm banned yeah, right now. I, I, so I'm, I, uh, I, I tend to, to be pretty, uh, closeted. I don't, I don't, I don't really get out on social media and say anything very ever. Um, so, um, so I, I tend not to get banned cause I just don't say anything. I, me on social media, I'm like the loud guy taking my shirt off to fight people. You know what? Bro? <laughs> Mel Todd got banned on TikTok for not saying anything. Outstanding. All right. So speaking of uh, your your banned on Facebook, Larry, but uh, where can people find Larry <laughs> Korea if they're not on Facebook? Uh, Facebook is MonsterHunterNation.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook sometimes. I'm on Twitter, Mo uh, Korea45 uh, or Monster Hunter 45. Sorry, and. Um, uh, basically, also, Steve and I do a podcast yeah. called Writer Dojo, and uh, that's available. It's a writing podcast. It's just like uh, it's just for writers trying to, to be better writers and get paid. Yeah. And uh, we're in our second season now, but that's available everywhere. Podcasts are Spotify, yeah. Anchor, uh, Apple. Uh, it's on YouTube also and Rumble. We've, yeah, we've shared it in our group, actually. So. And it's Doc actually cool. gets a shout out in the uh, in the sponsorship ad. In one of them, I did. Yeah. <laughs> So, I didn't know. Jack's like, I need you to check out this episode. And uh, you can find us, dear listener, over on the Twitters at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email us at blastersandbladespodcast at gmail.com. That is blastersandbladespodcast at gmail.com. Uh, be nice because Seska answers that one mostly because she books the show for us. You can find us on Facebook where all the shenanigans happen at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. You can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tack and tack blades. Again, anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. We promise one day we'll get a grown up website, but just not today. Uh, you can also support us over there for as little as 99 cents a month. Or you could support the show at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it is for the podcast. And I promise I will keep my co-hosts, Doc Seska and Nick Garber, duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrender. Never surrender. By the way, J.R., my cup's broken. All right. We're going to have to get people to donate some more so you can get another <laughs> cup. I'm the sober <laughs> operator because apparently all three of us podcasting drunk is just bad. <laughs> Who the thunk? Who knew? All right, Doc, bring it home. Okay. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For the absentee, addle-brained Nick Garber and J.R. Handley, I'm Seska. This was a Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back same time, same place, maybe. I don't know. Well, let's see See who doesn't land that. Uh, and indulging our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, all things that go boom, and, of course, torturing J.R., because why wouldn't we? Wait, am I the addle-brained one, or am I the absentee one? Uh... You're something. All right. Well, then.